Welcome to Tasting History, but we're not in the Tasting History kitchen. We are in the mythical kitchen, and I am joined by Josh Scherer. Hi, Josh. Max, thank you so much for having me in my kitchen. Yeah, this is your kitchen. <laughs> it's not really even a kitchen at this point, but anyway, why am I here? Why are we here? You're probably asking. And the reason is, so a year ago, I had a cookbook come out, you might remember, and at the very first signing, the person who did the Q&A with me was Josh. And it turns out, he has a cookbook coming out. What is the date? The date is March 11th. Depending on when this video comes out, either pre or post order it. It should be it should be out around when this when this video comes out. But anyway, one of the topics that I rarely get to talk about on Tasting History is the history of like more modern things like fast food. But in here you cover a lot of different dishes made with fast food? We sure do. So Good Mythical Morning, right? Rhett and Link, they've been doing this for 15 years, and all of the foods that they have made, including the Big Mac and cheese, taking macaroni and stuffing it inside of a Big Mac, culinary mm. innovation at its finest. Uh, fast food is also a really popular topic. I have been obsessed with fast food since I was young. I grew up in Orange County, which is just land of chain restaurants. And so to me, fast food's a really interesting lens to view history through. And so many of our dishes in here, from orange chicken parmesan to animal style mac and cheese, are inspired by famous fast food items. So I figured we could uh, eat some of those items and then talk about the history of it. Yeah, so we are talking about five items that changed fast food forever. Some of the greatest fast food items. That's a great YouTube title. Five <laughs> items that changed forever. Someone write that down. Yeah, That's right. good. That's good. Then, that might be what you just clicked on. Um, but yeah, so these are, these are his choices, but, but I concur on most, if not all of them, that I love all of these things. We'll see how it shakes out. You ready to eat the first one? Let's do the first one. Max, first up, we made a dish in the cookbook called Orange Chicken Parmesan. Obviously inspired by Panda Express Orange Chicken, uh, fused with another very American fried chicken invention, of course, chicken parmesan. And nobody actually knows the origin of chicken parm, unless you have any deep history sources inside there. I don't. Seems to be pretty murky, but the origins of orange chicken are very well documented because it was invented by Panda Express. Are you a fan of orange chicken? So this is my favorite dessert, I think. <laughs> Because it is a dessert, but yes, I love orange chicken. There is a very specific reason why it is a dessert. I, I can't, I have this in front of me and not eat it. This is, mm. It's so sugary and so hot. Freshly microwaved in that a takeout is, container. I was gonna say, mm -hmm. boy, they just delivered this and it's still <laughs> steaming. So, mm. orange chicken. I think this changed the face of specifically fast food Chinese food forever because it broke up the general show's hegemony, right? So you grew up in Arizona, right? I did. What sort of candy-coated fried chicken did you have at your local Chinese takeout? We had, so we called it dragon meat, and that is not the official name. That's what my dad called it. I'm pretty sure it was just sweet and sour chicken. <laughs> that makes sense. <laughs> but to get us to eat it as kids, he called it dragon meat. That's so funny. I, I grew up in Southern California, and so I always grew up with orange chicken being a thing. And so orange chicken was always my favorite food. I did not know that it was only invented in 1987 by chef Andy Cow, who was an executive chef at Panda Express at the time. They were opening a new location in Hawaii. He wanted to create a special dish um, that was representative of the type of food that Panda Express was making at the time. He took inspiration from a Hunanese dish called citrus peel chicken, hmm. except basically took the flavor profile of General Shows at the time, which was deep fried chicken covered in a very candy sweet sauce with soy, and all those aromatics, and I believe in the bottled orange chicken sauce, there is no actual orange in there. It is simply orange <laughs> essence, which I believe an orange kissed it. Uh, but, fascinating me, because you've heard of Wolfgang Puck Express. I have. Panda Express was the same idea. There was an original Panda Inn that is still standing uh, in Pasadena. If you ever want to go there it's on in Sunday Pasadena? brunch, we should go. Let's do it. Because they have an all-you-can-eat uh, brunch buffet, and it's you kind of hear that, and well, at least I do when I get really excited, and then you go there and you realize it's just Panda Express food. <laughs> Panda it was, but there's no sneeze guard. You <laughs> get to go <laughs> up and you get to take Correct. It and you never feel more free and more American than that. Um, you get the feeling of working at Panda Express, <laughs> essentially. But I've always wanted to go back to Panda Express and serve myself. Yeah. You know? And I've never been. I also want to bring tortillas to Panda Express um, and just make a little Panda Express taco. Are these dreams that other people have? <laughs> Or just so me. When you do Panda Express, do you do the white rice, fried rice, or the chow mein? Pure chow mein. I pure am a chow mein? Pure... That's, yes, I'm I, the same. I think they make the best chow mein in the game. So what's your three item entree that you get? 
Y'all's gotta get orange chicken, but then they have figured out how to make several proto orange chicken esque dishes. <laughs> For real, because this is this is how it happens, right? So General Shou's chicken. If I can dive back into the Chinese Civil War history real quick, General Shou's chicken, right? General Shou was an actual general in Hunan, but there's no record of General Shou's chicken ever existing until like the mid 1900s. And there was a chef who cooked for the Nationalist Party. They lost to Mao Zedong in the Chinese Civil War. A lot of them, including this chef, went to Taiwan, and he invented General Shou's chicken as an homage. He eventually moves to New York, opens up a restaurant where Henry Kissinger dined, and this chef credits Henry Kissinger for popularizing Hunanese food in America. So he did one good thing. <laughs> it's a broken clock right once a day. Let's not give him two. Um, but uh, the original General Show's recipe didn't have sugar in it because that's not common in Hunanese cuisine. Mm. It wasn't until he opened in America where he was like, they need sugar. They need sugar, <laughs> yeah. That's one thing that Americans need more of in their diet. I love it. See, I might have to do a full episode on that. You should. Yeah. I would watch that because all my information is just, they're, it's legit, but like, you know, not as legit as that guy. We'll do a deep dive. On to number two. So welcome to in and out <laughs> That's what a hamburgers. Max didn't grow up in California. I did not. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> like, what, are, what, what is he singing? What that's what a he... hamburger's all about. I can't afford the uh, rights to that song. Cut, cut that, cut enough. that. That's fair enough. <laughs> I choked on my own spit. I'm such a natural performer. <laughs> Don't edit that one out. Um, so here we have, this is an in and out double double. And there's a couple reasons why the double double specifically is special, but this is even more special because this is animal style. Animal style is on the secret menu, right? Yeah, yes. are you Are you an In-N-Out fan? So, kind of. I, the lines are ridiculous and I am unwilling to wait in line and I don't like their french fries. Yeah, that's fair. So, um, I go, but only if the line isn't long and that's rare. The french fries are like anachronistic to me. It's just, just take a potato. It's like eating a potato, like a raw potato. <laughs> yeah, effectively. Yeah. Right, but like back then, so In-N-Out was founded 1948 by Harry and Esther Snyder. It's still in the Snyder family today. I believe Lindsay Snyder is the current president, but it was founded in 1948 in Baldwin Park, California. So the first drive through in America, drive through hamburger restaurant was opened in 1947. Harry Snyder opens in 1948, and he was frustrated by the fact that cars couldn't communicate well with the people in the restaurant. So he actually invented, he was a notorious tinkerer, he invented a two-way call box radio. Or so he says. Is that's that like the what official we use story. Now? Correct. That same technology that's used today was allegedly invented by Harry Snyder um, at In-N-Out. And the first animal style burger was sold in 1961, 13 years after it was created. Animal style, you mustard sear the patty. So smear mustard on the patty before you sear it so it gets nice and caramelized. You put extra spread on it, which is their uh, Thousand Island dressing. So good. And then you put pickles on it. And I actually never knew why it was called animal style until I did a bit of a deep dive when we were writing the book. Uh, they used to refer to the unruly customers late at night because they would have long lines of cars as just animals, right? And so they'd be like, look at those animals go. And one day an animal came up <laughs> to the window to watch people make burgers. Harry Snyder thought it was important that people could see their food being made fresh. So one of these animals <laughs> just taps on the window and goes, hey, what are you making? Make me one of those. And it was a manager late at night making his own favorite when he could close down the ah. restaurant and tinker with it. Uh, and the guy ate it, said it was fantastic. How do I order this again? Manager goes, call it animal style. People know what it means. And here we have it. I would have never guessed that. I thought it just was because it had meat in it. <laughs> <laughs> I obviously haven't thought this through though. Um, let's try these. I, I love In-N-Out. They're so good. And so we have good. made animal style mac and cheese. Mmm. Mmm. I'm making a mess. What a delightful hamburger, man. It really is. I, I also ate some of the paper. Mm -hmm. That's, that's part, of, part of the, mm -hmm. that's, that's the experience. We call that goat style. <laughs> <laughs> you just put the paper inside and just eat it. I'll put a tin can in there if you want. So I remember, so I had never actually even heard of In-N-Out until they opened one in Arizona. I think it mm. was in Tempe when I was like in college. A while ago, um, and the lines, you know, because it was near ASU, it, it was just like around the block, mm -hmm. and I, I didn't quite get it, because um, I again wasn't willing to wait in line. And then I had my first one, and I was like, oh no, that's a delicious burger. Right? It's fascinating because so many people compare In and Out and Shake Shack because they were the burger mm -hmm. chains that had the two biggest cult followings at the time. Mm -hmm. Um, but In and Out is a contemporary of McDonald's, right? It opened in 1948 in yeah. Southern California. The reason places like McDonald's got so much bigger 
is because of the franchise model. They would sell their locations to people, the Snyder family, Harry Snyder was so particular about how his burgers are made that he was like, we're never gonna franchise and we're going to expand very slowly. All their trucks have to be within 24 hours from the produce being driven to the actual restaurants. Yeah. So they've taken like painstaking efforts to pay their managers really well, to run their stores really well. Uh, and that's why you get such a consistent product today. And I freaking love In-N-Out and I am very honored that it is featured in the cookbook, In-N-Out, please don't sue us because animal style, though it's not on the official menu, is a registered trademark and they have sued people before. Oops. Lawyer up, Max. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, so what is the dish in Mm. The cookbook. So that's based off of the animal style fries, which were added later to the secret menu. Also, the double double was a secret menu item that then went legit. So the double double was added to menus in 1966, 18 years after the restaurant opened, as the first secret menu item to go legit. And I don't believe anything has since. Um, My, the thing is, if it's a secret menu, mm -hmm. then but I feel like everybody knows about it, so it's not a best kept secret. No, it's it's an open secret. You know, it's like, like uh, what a would lot be of really secret is if I went to In and Out and ordered like egg foo young, <laughs> and they had it. I would love that. That would it. be impressive. So I was talking to someone and they insisted that like uh, Chipotle had marinara sauce somewhere, and I was like, I don't think that was the Chipotle that you walked into. <laughs> um, but no, it's. <laughs> The secret menu items, now that has also inspired other restaurants to have that, but then oh, ironically, yeah. places like McDonald's start advertising their secret menu, making it not secret not at secret. all. But in and outs has remained steadfast. I started a petition to get a secret menu item on the uh, in and out menu, and it didn't work. It's called yeah. the Frying Starchman, and it's where you take a brick of animal-style fries and just shove it between a bun, like an English chip buddy. <laughs> Why'd they laugh? I thought it was a good idea. <laughs> They don't have a veggie burger. It's a good, you know, if I had a... They don't have a veggie burger? I had a Hindu roommate in college, and he used to always do that. Uh, Shiva, you're you're an icon. I'm sorry they couldn't get it on the menu. Oh, well. But the dish in the cookbook, it's animal-style mac and cheese modeled after the fries. So uh, animal-style fries are French fries with Thousand Island cheese and caramelized onions. So we made a mac and cheese that we then put Thousand Island on with caramelized onions and then turned French fries into crispy breadcrumbs. And it is one of the most delicious things I have ever had. It was on GMM, one of the most iconic foods we ever made. Next, number three. I recognize this mm -hmm. shape. <laughs> it is Taco Bell. It is certainly Taco Bell, and this to Who me represents- it that way? Taco Bell. Taco Bell. Taco Bell, it's Taco <laughs> Bell. There we go. Uh, it's like the people who say like Starbucks. <laughs> Starbucks. <laughs> Where did you grow up? <laughs> uh, this is the Doritos Locos Taco. This is, to me, the absolute future of fast food. This is where it's all headed. This is like the, <laughs> if you thought it was going to like a plant-based uh, conservation focused t-shirt, now it's Doritos. But this was invented in 2012. It officially came out. However, I was on the forefront of this, Max. In 2009, there was a Facebook group. This is a true story started by a man named Todd Phillips called Taco Shells Made Out of Doritos Movement and it got several hundred thousand followers. Taco Bell took notice. Their CEO at the time was trying to quote, reinvent the hard shell taco um, because they hadn't updated it since the 60s when Taco Bell was founded. Uh, and they stumbled upon this Facebook page and Taco Bell, like the scene in Armageddon where they gather all of the oil engineers and the roughnecks <laughs> and the NASA astronauts, all of Taco Bell's best people and all of Frito-Lay's best people got on the, set, like, the year long process of transforming the hard shell taco into Doritos. They literally went to Home Depot and bought a paint sprayer and filled that with Dorito dust and found that didn't work. And then they went on a several years long engineering project and they came up with this. I went to the midnight release of this. That only, I swear to God, it's sophomore year of college, the midnight release of this that only members of the Facebook group uh, could go to. And turns out the engineers did a bad job. <laughs> yeah, well, that's just, um, that's just Taco Bell. I and mean. this is uh, in memoriam of Todd Phillips, who actually died of cancer at age 41, one year after the Drew Dose Logos Taco came out. But he did get to witness. He did get to witness the, the, fr the fruits of it. Uh, I don't believe he got any money, but he got to witness it. Of course he didn't. Yeah. <laughs> oh, man. Oh, Max, it's been mm. so long. There's just enough Dorito in there. Mm hmm A soup song. <laughs> the first iteration of this tested terribly with people. That was when they just tried to spray a normal taco shell with Dorito dust. Uh, but they came out with several flavors. They had Fiery, they had Flamas. All of this also happened on a handshake deal. There's no contract ever between Frito-Lay and Taco Bell. 
Um, and the CEOs, they're all sort of under the PepsiCo umbrella. Mm. But the CEOs of each literally met in a room, like, you know, I don't know, like Gorbachev uh, and, and was it Bush at the time? Like, yes. literally, they just met in a room and they were like... It's all, it all took place at Camp David. It was <laughs> yeah, exactly, thing. exactly. Uh, and they were just like, if we get the lawyers involved, this is never going to happen. And when they launched this, they sold 100 million tacos in 70 days. And wow. when asked about if they regretted not having a real contract, they were like, that's 100 million fewer tacos that we could have sold in that time. Because the, I mean, clearly Doritos is getting in on the action. 100%, and they actually, they like split marketing costs, but it was strictly a handshake agreement. There was never any contract. Uh, and this is, to me, the most successful fast food rollout of an item in history, except for maybe the Popeye's fried chicken sandwich, which <sighs> that had a bunch of fun videos from the people oh, in the in the so drive-thru good. lines. So good. Mm. So we took this, man, and we made a Doritos Locos meatloaf. Wait, what? What did you, what did you do? Well, what did you do? <laughs> that is the man, that is the age old question, isn't it? We were like, what if me, we wanted to make a hearty dinner option, right? You know, for somebody who loves the flavors of Taco Bell. Okay. And so we took like a taco spice packet, one of the Lowry's ones, because it's hard to make seasoning blends at home. And so we put that in a meatloaf and then we substituted some of the breadcrumbs for Doritos to give it that kind of corn masa flavor. All right. Turns out when it absorbs the fat from the beef, this is just what we do as our jobs, which is pretty cool. Some of you are teachers, some do data entry. We put Doritos in ground beef and see what happens. So we did that. Nice work if you can get it. <laughs> yeah, right? Uh, no, job market's slim these days. Um, and then we top it with cheese and fire sauce and it is just a delight. I want to try that one too. It's, it's pretty solid. Love it. Next! <laughs> Number four, I'm very excited about this. You're a Frosty man? I am a Frosty man. Can I, can I ask you why you love the Frosty? It's, I mean, it's ice, ice cream in any form is, is happy. I fully agree with that. Do you, is, this an, is this ice cream or a milkshake to you? Yeah. Right? That's what I say. Yeah. Also, the chocolate flavor is barely there. It's like a kiss, like a whisper of chocolate. Yeah, no, it's not. Yeah, it's it's just whisper. And I love that they, they put this ready for a straw. You can't <laughs> no. have this with a straw. That was, okay. All you have of, to let it melt. Literally all of these things. Is it ice cream? Is it a milkshake? You can't drink it with a straw. It barely tastes like chocolate. This was all by design. So Wendy's founder, Dave Thomas, opened up the first location in 1969, Columbus, Ohio. He knew he wanted a dessert on the menu at launch, and he actually tapped a local uh, manufacturing company that made restaurant equipment uh, called the Capus Corporation, and was like, I want, to, I want to make a dairy treat that is similar to the frosted malts served at the Thistletown Racetrack in Cleveland, Ohio. And he wanted it to be too thick to drink with a straw, so it felt really hearty. He felt that if you combine vanilla and chocolate, you get a lighter flavor that wouldn't overpower the burger, because he didn't want people just to come there for the milkshakes. Uh, and he wanted it to be its own unique treat that was neither milkshake nor ice cream. So they figured out a unique recipe to put into a soft serve machine that eventually became the Frosty. I'm not sure what that recipe is, but my mom always just told me, it's just Crisco. I'm sure that there's more than Crisco in here. That's not even how my mom sounds. <laughs> but I, I remember she would say, oh, it's just Crisco, that soft serve and stuff. I don't think that's there's, right. There, is, there do tend to be like hydrogenated oils and some sort of like gelling agent, like a guar gum in there. Mm. I remember I, uh, I don't think we have a Jack in the Box feature in the book, but I grew up, you know, dad worked late nights. Our neighbor worked at Jack in the Box when me and my brother were there on Saturday nights. And my dad actually, he was a limo driver, which is pretty sick. Um, but this woman would come home with uh, just a bag full of leftover Jack in the Box and give it to us. And when you're nine years old, that stuff hits. But one day she just dropped off like a sack of their milkshake mixture. And I remember as a child reading all the ingredients and being fascinated by it because it was just it was gum, gum Arabic, guar gum, all these like cellulose and gelling agents. And you tend to be able to taste that in fast food milkshakes. But the Frosty to me, it's actually a relatively clean ingredient label. You have all the, the thickeners and all that, um, but to me, this is like the best sweet treat that changed the game on ice cream. So good. No malt powder, which is disappointing to me because oh. malt to me is like one of the, it's MSG for sweet food, which is what I absolutely love about it. I have so much malt at my house. So I did a recipe a long time ago for, for a, uh, I think it was a croissant that I did. But this recipe called for malt. And this was before I started tasting history. <laughs> and I, so I, I couldn't find malt except in like 
it is like that big and it needed like a teaspoon. And so I have this much less a teaspoon still sitting. I'm sure it's not even good anymore, but if you need any malt. I feel like malt probably lasts for a while though, right? Like that's, I think malt I have was, no idea. Did they, I don't know if you know anything about this. Malt was used to like feed British troops because they thought it like made you strong. Yeah. That's part of the origin of it. We might be talking about that on a future episode. Ah, hey, oh, little teaser. Maybe um, I can use some of that malt. <laughs> Finally, you should just, you did Titanic week, you should just do malt week. Just to make it that. <laughs> all you know, malt, all the time. The views would be down, except, you know, you'd finally get rid of that damn malt. It's worth it. Uh, Wendy's founder, Dave Thomas, had a private island, and he had his own frosty machine on the island, and he would invite people out to the island and just freshly dish them up a frosty. I feel like I would have liked Dave Thomas. He seemed like a good guy. Yeah, and yeah, he did I, his own commercials. He did, so... He did his own commercials. Um, he also worked with a prominent KFC franchisee. I didn't know this about his story. He like served in the Korea War, and then he was a cook, and he started working with this prominent KFC franchisee. Back in the day, Colonel Sanders would just go to these little conventions and be like, hey, you should convert your family-owned restaurant into a KFC franchise that can make you money. And so that happened with the family that Dave Thomas was working for. And Dave apparently got pretty close with Colonel Sanders, and he would try and give him these new ideas, including, hey, people want to feel connected to food, especially as we see these big franchises. You should personally be in the commercials, Colonel Harlan Sanders. Uh, and then he kind of said no. And then Dave Thomas was in, I think, over 800 Wendy's commercials throughout his career uh, before he died in the 2000s. And so he was sort of able to recognize his own dream and his own tactics, and now we have Wendy's. I just love the idea that all of these like fast food kings hung out together, <laughs> like, like oil. Honestly, it's like oil barons yeah, in like the eighteen hundreds. Carl and Carl's Jr. <laughs> hanging out. You know? It is kind of kind of that way though, because I mean, it was it was a gold rush at the time, right? Like yeah. all these. Uh, yeah, they all fans. kind of opened within a very short amount of time. I yeah, feel. like can you name? I mean, Wendy's was even kind of later in that in yeah. in sixty nine, which is incredible that he was able to fast track it to being as successful as it was. But if you can think of like restaurants that have opened in the past 15 years that have made a mark, I couldn't tell you. Not not to this degree, no. Yeah. Here's to you, Dave. So how does this fit oh, into shit. the book? Oh shoot, I'm so where glad is, you asked Where back. is this in this book? So one, of, <laughs> one of the ways that people consume Frosties, I don't actually do this, but I know a lot of people do, they will dip their fries in them. Oh yes. Ethically opposed to that, but I wanted to give it a fair shot, that French fry and Frosty flavor. So what we have done is I made a crust out of French fries, and then I made a Frosty cheesecake filling. So we have a recipe in there for a Frosty and French fry cheesecake uh, that I'm very proud of, and I think is better than just French fries dipped into a Frosty. Actually, that sounds really good. I do not do the, I'm, I'm with you. For me, French fries and ketchup are just a match made in heaven. Why, would you, ever, why would you ever break that up? Um, but that sounds really good. Next! Number five, the last one, we come to the daddy of all fast food restaurants, mm. Mickey D's. Mickey D's, they changed the game in so many ways. Uh, Ray Kroc, they said he wasn't in the food business, he was in the real estate business because they franchised out. Um, one weird thing that happened is that they got these like all-star franchisees that then started providing all of the innovation to the company because they also had a stake in it. They wanted their five, six, seven restaurants to succeed. And so the Big Mac was, I believe, invented in Pittsburgh in the late 60s. And then we get the Egg McMuffin, which was kind of credited as the first mainstream fast food breakfast, invented the prototype in 1971, was a franchisee in Santa Barbara who had a bunch of restaurants. He calls up Ray Kroc and he says, Ray, I have the idea that's gonna revolutionize McDonald's, but I'm not gonna tell you what it is. You just have to fly out here and you have to taste it. Uh, and Ray Kroc wrote about that in his autobiography that came out in 1977. And he was like, he was right to do that because I never would have said yes to the idea of a fast food breakfast, but he tasted it and it was so transcendent that he had to put it on the menu. I don't know how transcendent it could have been at the time because the original <laughs> Egg McMuffin was served open face with a powdered hollandaise that was reconstituted with water and then uh, a ham coin and this franchisee in Santa Barbara, he I'm actually- sorry, a ham coin? Ham coin, well open it, let's open this up. Let's see, let's see what we got in here. I always wondered why it was a ham coin. They call it Canadian bacon, but then you'll always get Canadians saying, this is not Canadian bacon, this is a ham coin. And they have kind of a point, like Canadian pea meal bacon right. has the loin attached, but there's also back on it. This is like, I don't even know, this is kind of an emulsified ham product. I think it's delicious, they call it Canadian bacon. 
But I always wondered why this kind of looked like Eggs Benedict, and it was just supposed to be Eggs Benedict. Okay. But then he realized that powdered hollandaise is probably not great, and uh, bad to put on a sandwich coming out of a fast food drive-thru, so he put a slice of American cheese on it, uh, and then one year later, another franchisee's wife gave it the name Egg McMuffin, giving Ray Kroc the confidence to put it out nationwide. I kind of like the idea of them sticking with the hollandaise <laughs> and hi hiring a saucier for every McDonald's location <laughs> to whip up some hollandaise. Jeff, my, my emulsification has Balkan! <laughs> <laughs> but cheese works too. <laughs> I was telling Annalise about that story and she's like, Oh, good for that guy sticking to his, or not sticking to his guns, you know, and like killing his darlings. I'm like, I never would have done that. Mm -mm. I would have been just slinging hollandaise in people's drive through windows, you know, slapping it against the car. Sorry, you can't eat no egg. <laughs> yeah, mine is without egg, because I'm allergic. And that's okay, it's still good. <laughs> right? Though usually I do the sausage biscuit if I'm, mm -hmm. if I'm, I don't get a lot of McDonald's breakfast, but if I do. So, I love McDonald's breakfast. I'm typically a sausage McMuffin with a cheese fan. I think their breakfast sausage is the most perfectly seasoned meat in all of fast food. But McDonald's is basically the reason that we have fast food breakfast in America. Without them launching in 71, never would have seen it. 10 years later, 18% of all McDonald's sales, which were in the billions, were from breakfast alone. And they put all the pressure on, Burger King tried to come out with a breakfast sandwich immediately after, and then realized that their charbroiler, which is effectively a, a grill, you can't cook an egg on it. And so they had to start retrofitting all of their thousands of restaurants to try and keep up with McDonald's to have flat tops to cook the eggs. Not only that, this franchisee in Santa Barbara, their eggs are perfectly <clears throat> round, right? Yeah. He literally invented That's like- what I don't like. Teflon molds to make perfectly round eggs that you still see in McDonald's today. Yeah, it's and, weird. And so Max, we thought, what if this but Olive Garden? And that's what's in the book. Wait, okay. <laughs> I don't know. I don't even know how it happened. I don't I know. I cannot tell you how it happened. I don't happened. know that it it's should have. Chapter. What's, what's up here? It up, open it up to the first chapter. I'm really proud of the photo. There it is. There it is. There it is. So this, this is our garlic bread McMuffin. Um, <laughs> we even styled it like an olive garden. So you got an Italian sausage patty. You got like an am amatrachana sauce with the, uh, the bacon in there. Fried egg. And then uh, some, some Parmesan cheese. And that is one of the best breakfast sandwiches I've ever had. You brush the bun down with a garlic butter and some parsley. And so that is how it correlates to the cookbook. A little homage to the breakfast sandwich that changed the entire game. See, one of my favorite things about the, the cookbook is that it does have a bit of your, it has a bit of you in here. The, There's so much Keep in the there. oven on, all in caps. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, all of the fun. prose is uh, perfectly unhinged and the editor didn't touch it. Um, we got a lot of notes that just said like typo or joke, and so I control F searched that. Typo and just, or joke. And just said joke on all of them. Um, so completely untouched, just the unfiltered ramblings um, of, of me. So, I love it. Well, yeah, yeah. I am excited to cook from it, or maybe you come over and cook for me. Um, love trying these all out. Love getting some fast food history because I really get to touch on fast food history, and uh, loved hanging out with you. I, dude, thank you so much for having me. Thanks for letting me ramble because my fiance is really tired of hearing it and so is everybody in this room, but. I love it. My audience gets to hear you ramble. Mwah. And thank you for letting us use the mythical kitchen since my kitchen doesn't really work with two people. Anytime, man. I can't wait for Malt Week to come out. <laughs> malt Week, baby. <laughs> funny. Mark your calendars. May 6th through the 13th is officially <laughs> Malt Week. No, it's, <laughs> Max, you're never going to do it unless we put a date on it. Now you have to. Thanks everyone. <laughs> See you next time on Tasting History. I'm gonna put a link to this in the uh, in the description in that box down there. And um, yeah, brew some bathtub beer. How many bathtubs you got? <laughs> One, but it's large. We could get a good <laughs> bathtub. Well, that's a beer tub now. <laughs> you can still bathe in it, but you know. Bye everyone. See ya.